My partner and I were working the business, but we were working you know, 70 hours a week. Whether it's financially rewarding or not, in itself, that wasn't sustainable. I'm Danny Vallant, and this is Dirty Linen, the podcast that takes the issues the hospitality industry finds hard to air in public and shakes them all about. This week on Dirty Linen, we're talking about hospitality business models. What works, what doesn't, what's harder than it used to be, and how can COVID be an opportunity to do things differently for the better? Tim Mann is the man who killed brunch. His all-day cafe, bar and restaurant, Grub, in Melbourne's Fitzroy, reopened after the shutdown without an egg or an avocado on the premises. He's used the pandemic as an opportunity to reconsider every single part of his business and to see if he can't make it work for him, not just as an enterprise, but as part of a fulfilling life that's not all eggs, avo and alt milk. Tim, hello. Thanks for being with us. Hello to you. Not a problem. Uh, so tell us what sort of place Grub is. Ooh, uh, well, Grub started off originally as my my home or our home, me and my partner, um, and then it was too big as a home, so we really just started to operate as a venue, I suppose. Food and beverage became an adjunct to the venue. It was really just a space that we were growing things because it was a greenhouse. Then we put the van on there to basically have a coffee machine. And since then, it's grown into, I suppose, yes, a venue, but more ostensibly a cafe, restaurant, bar. It's a very particular place. I mean, the outdoor area is as big as the indoor area. There's still the van out the front. And I mean, for me, it's always had a great community feeling. It feels like a place where things happen. It's not just a place where you come for something to eat and something to drink. And I remember, I guess it's last year, having some delicious sardines on toast in the garden and yeah just there's dogs and people and it just feels very welcoming. I'm personally a little bit suspicious of the word community but having said that I think uh, it's the word that we use a lot in respect to the venue, uh, in respect to how it accommodates uh, various needs and so forth from our locals or our tourists or our friends but yes. It is, that, it is that place. Why does community make you suspicious? Because uh, I just think it's an overused word and I think it, um, I think if we just used the word us rather than community, it might be simpler. Yeah. Do you think maybe the fact that there's this idea of community and responding to people that come to the venue also means there's a pressure to be everything that they want you to be? I think that there is a pressure for that and everybody uh, is, um, takes takes or needs from it what they want or need, um, if that makes sense. So another word that you could use is stakeholder. So if you're a supplier to the venue, you've got a different you've got a different requirement from that venue to if you're a customer. And if you're a customer, you might be an elderly person who wants uh, to find out about plants and have a have a tea, a herbal tea, or you could be having a wedding, in which case you're having a full-on family celebration. So they're completely different requirements. But having said that, hopefully the venue can can meet all of those, that what dyspora of, of need. So do you feel that, that you were doing that a bit too much though? Because what you were doing then, which was, you know, all day, every day. I, def- I definitely feel... Yes, I definitely feel that the venue was under pressure to be all things to all people at all times. Uh, As a consequence, we were open seven days a week. We were open from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. It's a big timeline. It's a a big machine to operate. Um, and, And sometimes I definitely question whether we were delivering anything uh, the best that we possibly could. Uh, Certainly, COVID has required, I think, the industry in general and probably individuals as well to to sit back and go, okay, what are we trying to do here and and how are we going to achieve it? Uh, We've certainly done that as as an operation. And the all things to all people at all times, just privately, it just smacks a little bit of entitlement 
And I think that we could be a little bit more sincere in our endeavours to simplify things and uh, rein it back a little bit. When you say entitlement, do you, do, you, do you mean that, like, who are you to say that you can be all things to all people? Exactly. I think it's a little bit that, but I also think that the, uh, you know, fundamentally we're in the middle of Fitzroy. We're definitely a, uh, a well-off society um, and there are massive demands that come with that. Even if we just start looking at dietaries, uh, is dietaries uh, an act of entitlement or an, an act of empowerment? I'm not the person to answer that, but it's definitely it definitely is a huge control controlling factor of what it is that you have to offer. Yeah, it's interesting. I was um, chatting to Duncan Falgamud in from Africola in Adelaide yesterday, and he said it's so interesting, like in the whole of um, coronavirus, like the whole of shutdown. When we, were, when we were doing takeaway, we had one vegan. Oh, really? Like no, there were no <laughs> dietary. Yeah. It, was, it was like suddenly everyone was back to basics and, you know, I guess if, whether it was that they just wanted to eat their comfort food that they'd grown up with, but whatever it was, like, yeah, they could eat everything again. It's, it's very interesting. It is interesting. I mean, I... I... I don't want to belittle, you know, a celiac or or making some dietary to- choices or or even recognizing your own your own place within the um, the food chain, uh, and you make choices uh, accordingly. But um, it is it does I think to be frank, it does come from a sense of entitlement. Yes, that you can make those choices. Yes. It, it it that's def- that's what entitlement is having the choice. <laughs> yeah. So let's pull back a little bit because when we spoke last year, when I wrote my review, you're all about the sardines and the other delicious things I had. You t- when we were chatting for that, you spoke of hospitality as broken. So can you talk about that? What do you mean? I think hospitality is broken. This is pre-COVID um, because we also talk about a thing called sustainability. And, and the industry was basically surviving or barely surviving uh, on what I refer to as an un- unsustainable model because it relied on work power that was just either not being paid for or not being rewarded in any, in any shape or form. So um, my partner and I were working the business, but we were working you know, 70 hours a week. And ostensibly, that's just not whether it's financially rewarding or not, it's also just not emotionally sustainable that you're giving all of that and uh, you don't have a life, life work balance. And just that one ingredient, you can look at sustainability in a whole range of different areas, but in itself, that wasn't sustainable. And in that sense, I think it's broken. Okay. Well, you had um, a, a pause that was forced upon you with shutdown uh, I mean, what would have happened if you hadn't had that and hadn't had this forced opportunity to reconsider? Um, we, in terms of Grub, we certainly, we've, we're very seasonally based, which means that we, we force the pause anyway, meaning that before winter comes, we reorganise the menus, we do a different setup. And we decide on what hours we're going to be open. We decide what menu is going to be suitable for those hours and so forth. So indirectly, we're not, uh, we're not a set and forget model. Uh, COVID was definitely a, a slightly different pause and a much stronger pause where we had to readdress, okay, what it was that we're doing. But uh, certain decisions that were being made, you know, even in December, uh, were more based about bushfires, uh, was Based about the business itself, in fact, what was what was being what was working, what wasn't working, um, and COVID just forced a stop. And when we're still coming out of that, but I, I think any owner has to listen to the business itself and what what it tells it, and hopefully um, move forward listening to it. Well, so what has the business told you during the pandemic? Um, 
during the pandemic, the business said uh, that it was too big. Um, out of the 26 staff that we had, uh, we ended up with four on JobKeeper. As a result, we had to readdress our rosters. We have to readdress our offer. We have to readdress um, the hours of operation, all of those things, and we make decisions accordingly. Um, definitely, even before COVID, you know, business itself in terms of just uh, bums on seats or income was definitely down. And things like functions were down, uh, whether that was because of bushfires or whether that's just because of the nature of the beast, I, I can't really know. But but you have to, you, you're constantly feeding your, your uh, animal, which is your business, as well as trying to uh, manoeuvre it into into the next water bowl. So what have you done as you've reopened? Uh, at the moment, we're currently only open for lunches. So we decided that we were going to uh, concentrate on a particular time period, which is lunches. Uh, a lot of that had to do with the initial takeaway model, uh, which is just sort of going, okay, what do people want to eat at lunch? Um, and our window is only from 11, uh, sorry, from 10 a.m. till 3 p.m. So it's a really short window. Um, and we've got the staffing to accommodate that and we've got the menu to accommodate that. So how many egg dishes do you have on the menu, Tim? Uh, we don't do any egg dishes actually at the moment. Oh, how many? <laughs> how many? How many complaints do we have? Um, we do have complaints about. Uh, I wasn't going to ask that. That's so interesting. That's what you felt coming out of my mouth. I was going to ask you how many avocados you're smashing. Oh, uh, we're not even smashing avocados. So at the moment, uh, be because <laughs> we've we've eliminated this concept of uh, well. We, we do talk about it. So we've eliminated the concept of all day. We've eliminated the, indirectly the concept of brunch and we've read, we're trying to redefine, okay, what would a lunch look like? Uh, which means, in fact, on our, on our specific menu, we've removed eggs and we've also removed avocado. Uh, the two, and so you have had a few complaints? And we have had, uh, I don't know that there have been complaints, but certainly when you're known for a particular um, thing and people ex have that expectation from your venue or from your site uh, and all of a sudden it's no longer there, yeah, there's some raised eyebrows and they go, okay, um, how are we going to navigate this this area now? So I don't think we've had, certainly we've had some customers that have walked out and they said, well, we really wanted our poached eggs and we said, that's fine, <laughs> um, go somewhere else and they've gone somewhere else. But uh, otherwise, we've just had people who make decisions accordingly. And, I mean, was it that you had to have not only soy milk but almond milk and oat milk that really killed brunch for you? Coffee is tough. Coffee is really, it's, it's a very personal thing. Uh, so when we're talking about this notion, of, first of all, coffee is, it's every day. It's a $4 spend. It's uh, very personal, so it's a long black, it's a short black, it's a ristretto, it's a macchiato, it's a magic. It's a, just the computations of that, of that choice are astronomical and very personal and very specific. And just in order to deliver that to what would be referred to as modern standards uh, is very, very costly. And, yeah, that indirectly uh, sort of took us away from that breakfast scenario. I think the other thing that takes you away from breakfast scenario is, is the willingness for people to spend money. So uh, smashed avocado, really, you, you, it's limited to, to what a customer is likely to spend on that. And uh, you can trick it up however you want whether you've got sherry vinegar or you've got pomegranate or you've got goat's cheese or, or you've got sunflower seeds, whatever is the add-on ingredient, it'll still cost you. It'll cost you in terms of your chef. It costs you in terms of your supply chain. Uh, you have to constantly be making it. It's not going to hold that well in the, in the fridge. 
and and those are all costs that you have to consider. And so, how can you have you crafted your your lunch menu to to be a bit smarter and um, to be a bit more business minded? Well, uh, we've certainly limited it, uh, so it's it's a much smaller menu. Uh, generally, uh, our menus would sit at around about. 15 to 20 dishes. I think currently we're sitting at around about 12. Um, it, we, we do have some mains on there. So we've got a kangaroo stew, for example. We've got a, a marrow stew. We've got three toasties. But in fact, today we've just said that we're now only going to – we used to have uh, sandwiches available in the cabinet to take away. We've just removed those uh, cold sandwiches and they're only going to be made to order. Um, again, because you want to limit the wastage and you want to limit, um, th- well, things that aren't working. Okay. And how is it going? How are you feeling about things? Um, nervous. Um, I feel uh, positive in some respects because uh, we feel a little bit more in control and we don't feel like we're quite so much... Um, We've, I suppose, we've reduced we've reduced our overall um, costs. We've reduced our, uh, our the demand has, has been reduced in indirectly. That's reduced our stress. It doesn't mean that we don't strive to deliver a good product at a good time, and and it's been well received. It certainly has been well received. Yeah. Have you got a target of hours that you want to work per week in your business? Me personally, yeah. Uh, I, I, I would say a 38-hour week sounds about right. So that's pretty much halving what you used to do before. Yeah, it is. I would say that we're heading towards that. I, it's hard to know how you define work. Like, for example, I do the garden. <laughs> so because I do the garden, I'm watering the garden, uh, it takes me about two and a half hours to water the garden every week, roughly. Uh, do I clock on when I'm doing that work? No, not necessarily. It's work. It's work that I could be watering my own personal garden that I'm that I'm not doing. Um, but it is. It's definitely part of our venue. It's definitely work. It's been. There's been a lot of hospitality people who are sort of noticing the fact that they've got more time, whether they're using that to sleep or to spend with their families um, or to, you know, just walk around in the world. Um, do you think that, yeah, have you heard that as well? Yes, I have, definitely. Definitely. There's a, uh, that, that's across, across the board. Everybody has been, in fact, al- almost everybody I speak to, they go, I uh, just can't believe that we've got some time to, uh, you know, watch Netflix. Uh, I'm amazed that I've got time, in fact, to cook dinner. Wow. <laughs> it's, it's quite extraordinary. Yeah, it is extraordinary. In that sense, it's been, it's been a blessing. So interesting. So what do you think people could take from your experience when they think about their own businesses and how they might reshape them? Um, I always think, I, I think if you, I don't believe that any, anybody who runs a business doesn't do this, where you have the ability just to be able to step aside, look at it uh, with new eyes, with new, um, with a new vision, and just maybe drive down a different lane or turn it in a different direction. I think most business owners do that. Um, and and something like COVID is, is is certainly a great opportunity to do that. I mean, to me, it feels like you you had the opportunity to to really stand back and think, oh, what what who are we? What who are we as people? Who who are we as a business? And how do we best express that? Definitely, I think there's there's always you know the magic questions: who you are and how you define yourself. A why you are is a really good question. So why are we doing what we're doing? Why you know, why am I watering the garden? <laughs> why, um, why am I picking up uh, takeaway containers from Coburg? Um, and what are we trying to achieve? Yeah, it's how we deliver that. You, you're always asking those questions, always. How are we paying the bills? Um, what, what does a customer want when they, when they get here? Where are they going to sit? Why are they going to sit there? They're, they're questions that you're constantly asking yourself. 
So what's your ultimate why for Grub? Why does it exist? Ooh, this, yeah, the, I, I don't know that I found the answer. Uh, sometimes I think we're working for the landlord. Sometimes I think we're working for our supply chain. Uh, and sometimes I think we're working for our customer base. And I think the answer sits somewhere in there. I, I definitely get some personal enjoyment out of it, but I've spoken to you before about those nanoseconds. They're only nanoseconds, but they're very, very worthy nanoseconds. Um, it's, it's, it's a hard business. Tell me about some of those nanoseconds. Relate a few for me. Uh, the nanoseconds are when you can look across a room and it's got a certain energy in it and it's got a hum and things are in the right place at the right time and there's a sense of peace and there's a sense of satisfaction. And uh, they're nanoseconds and it, it's really rewarding. I love those moments and I think when I was just staying at home all the time, those are the moments that I missed, you know, from a from a diner's perspective where just that feeling of everything humming and yeah. that you're in the middle of something but you're also part of it and you're, yeah, it's just that's correct. Yeah. That's that's beauty. Uh, that's, that sense of in, what I call it, it is beauty. It's a sense of engagement. It's a sense of belonging. It's a sense of sense of being a part of something that's greater than itself. Um, and yeah, I, I do think that in hospitality we strive for those moments. And if you don't achieve them, <laughs> I reckon it'd be even tougher. But um, I think whether you're a chef or a waiter or even a customer, I think that's what you, you're you looking for, a sense of connection, I suppose, and a, a sense of being at, being at one. I wonder as you do less, like you've opened for fewer hours and re the menu is more tightly focused, I, I wonder if that means you'll be able to have those nanoseconds more frequently. I suppose, you, you, you know, in one sense you think, well, the longer you're open, the, the more of those moments you're going to have, but actually it might work the opposite. No, it, it, yeah, you're right. It doesn't work like that. And you can't, uh, you know, sometimes it might be at 8 p.m. at night when the bride enters. Um, that moment is uh, exquisite. It, it generally is. She's always radiant. She's always beautiful. Uh, there's a joy in, in the space that is, um, I have to use the term, priceless. And that's very, very different to the feeling that you might get at 11 a.m. when the place is buzzing and everybody's settled eating their smashed avocado. The nanosecond still exists, but they're, they're slightly different. They're, it's, um, and you can't, you can't sort of, I don't, well, in our particular venue, I don't think you can necessarily say that one that one nanosecond is of greater value than another. What I can say is that you try and um, and reach a balance in your offer, definitely. Beautiful. So are, are there any broader changes you, you, you could see happening in society or the hospitality industry or in terms of government regulations that would help hospitality businesses thrive? We're part of a very big picture. The reality is uh, retail is going through massive structural change. Hospitality is fundamentally retail and is going through that change. The changes in terms of the gig economy are really, really um, white anting the industry, I believe. Uh, the race to the bottom in terms of your price points is white anting the industry and that's really tough. And you've got a housing market or a commercial rental market that doesn't seem to have uh, that doesn't seem to be based on on that economy. And so the hospitality is kind of stuck. It either has to get uh, a great rental deal moving forward or it will have to get support economically from its customer base, which means raising prices. Um, I don't know what the outcome is going to be. I do know that it's not going to be easy and that a lot of people will not survive it. Yeah, it's definitely tough yards coming up. Yeah. 
It is tough, yeah. It's, uh, you know, the, the degustation menu at $300 a head, I can see that there's potentially still still a market for that. And there's no doubt that there's uh, a growing market for uh, a bucket, a, what is it, a bucket of nuggets and tips uh, where you can feed a family for, for five, well, for $3 a head. Even if you're going to a nursing home, a nursing home, your bottom line meal sits at around about somewhere between six and eight dollars a unit um hospitality is part of that market and that's that's hard you somewhere in between the five dollars a head to the three hundred dollars a head <laughs> it's it, i guess i mean it's it sounds like a pretty broad broad playing field but um i think it i think what you what you've done in terms of focusing your offering fi- deciding what you're not as well as what you are is probably key to finding a place in 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 that landscape. Uh, hopefully, yes. <laughs> I, I'm, I don't believe that I've found the solutions yet, but uh, we're certainly working towards it. Um, and we are definitely trying to trying to simplify every every aspect, um, even in terms of our supply chains. You know, we've I think we've got something like, you know certainly a hundred suppliers or something you've got your mushroom supplier your black garlic supplier your uh, egg supplier your pork supplier your kangaroo supplier all of those elements and that that's just uh that's tough on business and it's yeah it's expensive if you can simplify it but you simplify it without blanding it out exactly. you don't want to bland it out though do you no you definitely don't so again it's that balance yeah I always, mm. I always go for a line of personal integrity or sincerity or making some ethical choices. And every decision, you, you have to think about it. You just do. It's the nature of the beast. Yeah, you've got to be able to stand behind what you're doing. I think you do. Well, yeah, I think you do. <laughs> Even if you're in McDonald's, you've, yeah, yeah, I, I believe you do. Mm. So, Tim, yeah. uh, when I come in for lunch, what should I have? Oh, good question. Uh, <laughs> Um, today I actually had the kangaroo stew. Uh, the kangaroo stew, it's, it's a sweet dish. Uh, it's, it was, it's cold outside. We've got the fire going and I just had, it's served with some saffron potatoes. It's a single bowl meal. It's warm. It's yummy. That's what I had. Mm, that sounds so good. And, and I can have a glass of wine with it, can't I? Yes, you can have a glass of wine with <laughs> it. All right. Thank you so much. Um, I'm looking forward to the kangaroo stew uh, and, yeah, it's really fantastic to hear your perspective. Um, I love the way you think about the industry and certainly wish you all the best with um, the ongoing project of Shaping Grub. Okay. Thanks so much, Danny. This is Dirty Linen and I'm Danny Vallant. We air the issues that the hospitality industry finds hard to talk about. We spend a week thrashing around each issue, hearing from different people with unique perspectives. We want to hear from you as well. If you have something that needs to be said about a topic, get in touch so we can include your perspective. Contact us at dirtylinen at deepintheweeds.com.au or hit us up on Insta at Dirty Linen Podcast. We can't wait to hear from you. This is a Deep in the Weeds production.